Hey guys, uh, welcome back. I feel like I'm getting to know you. We're spending so much time together. Anyways, hey, we're into focus four right now on part D, caught in between. This is the, um, the, the least source of fatalities in construction sites. But nevertheless, um, one of the ones that we wanted to talk about, you know, I, I get the feeling from, you know, after we spend all this time talking about safety that, you know, some of you might say, hey, this construction thing isn't for me. But let me encourage you. Construction is a great, great field to be in. It's a lot of fun. It's a great, it's a great uh, industry to be in, and you, it's a tremendous rewards in terms of just a good feeling of stuff that you've been able to build over the years and contribute to the building of. So uh, I, I certainly don't want to discourage you because we're talking a little bit about some of the hazards. We just want to make you safe so that you can get to the place so you can retire like me. So let's jump into caught between the objectives for this session is list the three main causes of the caught in or caught uh, between fatalities. We want to describe how control, how to control hazards that cause caught in or caught between deaths. Describe safe equipment operation <clears throat> when there is a rollover hazard and Describe three key employer requirements that protect workers from caught in or caught between. So caught, uh, caught in and caught between fatalities uh, represent a little less than 10% of the construction fatalities. There are three main types that we want to talk about today. Trench cave-ins, moving parts of machine engines or power tools, and vehicle rollover. So let's get into it. First off, trench cave-ins. Cave-ins, um, so basically what we're talking about is excavations here. When you're working to put pipelines in, you're working to put foundations in, you've got an excavator, you're cutting a trench, uh, a trench is, uh, you know, you can you can do an open excavation, but if the trench is higher than it is deep, it's considered, uh, I mean, higher than it is wide, it's considered a trench. So um, the thing about trenches is that soil, you really have to know what you're doing around soil because there's different types of soil. And not all dirt is the same. And um, trench cave-ins can happen suddenly with almost little or no warning. Sometimes they give a little bit of a warning. They'll get some cracks in the surface, but other times, uh, other times you won't even know it. Sometimes there's a little bulge in the bottom of the side wall on a trench, but a, a lot of times it just uh, it just collapses. Um, most deaths from cadence occur in trenches from 5 to 15 feet deep. Now, you might think to yourself, 5 feet, that's not very deep. You know, how's that going to kill me? But remember, a lot of times, um, you know, even in a 5-foot trench, you're not standing up in there. You're down on your hands and knees installing pipe or, or putting something in, into that trench, right? Uh, so that's... that's um, you know, that's, if the collapse happens, that's how it catches you. The other thing is, even if it catches your legs, it can lock you in there. It's really hard to dig yourself out, and you can't pull your legs out if it collapses on your legs, traps them. You got, somebody else has got to dig you out. Soil moves too fast to, to uh, escape. It takes just over a half a second for a six-foot trench to collapse. Imagine that, a half a second. You know, your human reaction time, as we mentioned earlier, when we're talking about falls, is a half a second. That 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 leaves not not much time. You know, that leaves no time for you to escape. So uh, so the idea. I was talking with a laborer over um, in in the Tri Cities here in Washington, and and she said, "Oh, I'm not afraid of trench collapses. I'm not. I'll just jump out." And she was she was totally um, totally 
thinking that she would have time to get out of a, a trench before it it caught her. And it just it you know it's just a she was just really fooling herself. And uh, and you know I mean we all want to be courageous and bravado and show that we're tough and stuff like that, but you know, uh, uh, you, you know, this is just something you have to be aware of. It's, you, you can't beat the speed of, of, a, of a trench collapse. It's going to catch you. So what are the things that cause um, the walls of a trench to collapse? Unstable soil. So the unstable soil can be the, the composition of the soil itself. It can be rocky, um, you know, or loamy, which is a lot of uh, organic material and doesn't compress really tight. Um, and this is called type, type C uh, soil. And um, so when that's under pressure, um, you know, with vibration or whatever from, from vehicles or so uh, around it, uh, or, you know, jackhammering or anything like that, that stuff can, can slough off. If it's real sandy, Sandy soil is very loose. I mean, anybody that's ever been out on the beach and built a sandcastle knows, you, you know, even if you pack it with water, it's very loose and it, it'll, it'll, it'll fall, fall down easily. Um, so, uh, so unstable soil, the only super stable is really not soil itself, it's rock. <laughs> if you have to cut through rock, you don't need to, brace it up with anything because it's rough, right? It's not going to fall. So what else can cause a train, uh, cave in? Excess of weight, such as machinery or a spoil pile too close to the edge of the trench. So, um, you know, you see all the time when you're driving, you know, through a construction area, you see the backhoe or the excavator working. Well, that piece of equipment's very, very heavy. And sometimes they're rolling that right along the sides of that, that trench. That can cause that trench to collapse. If it's on the street and vehicles from the street are driving by, that's causing vibration in the soil. The soil pile uh, is the pile of dirt that is being dug out of the hole. They're putting it someplace. Usually they put it right next to the excavation so that they can put it right back in. But a lot of times the operators are not well trained and they'll set it right along the edge. By the OSHA regulation, that soil pile has got to be at least two feet back from the edge of the excavation. A lot of, a lot of excavators do not know that, so they'll put it right next to the edge. It costs too much weight on the side of that, that, um, that trench. If water gets into the trenches, this will erode away underneath. Very, very easy to weaken a trench if water is in a trench. You definitely don't want water in trenches. That's not something you want to get pumps in there, get the water out, dry it out. And as I mentioned, vibration from vehicle travel or equipment near the trench, any one of those things can cause the trench cave in. What must employers do to make the trench safe? Uh, it is the employer's responsibility. This is not up to you as a worker to try to figure out what to do, especially as an apprentice. You don't know anything yet. You're just getting started into the trade, right? So ask a lot of questions. Ask a lot of questions. You want to know what's going on, right? So the employers are supposed to train you about how to work in trenches. They're not supposed to just tell you, hey, kid, get down in there. Shut up. Stop whining. Get down in there. No, if they say that, forget about it. Don't go down. You're supposed to get training on trench hazards. Somebody has got to be designated as a competent person before the trenching starts. The competent person is a person the employer designates that understands trenching hazards and knows how to fix them and how to address them and has the authority to correct them. It's usually the foreman or the superintendent on the job 
but somebody's got to be the competent person. The entrenching, there's lots of things that competent person has to be able to do, such as identify the soil type. The competent person, that there's type A, type B, type C, and type D soil, and they have to know those soil types. I won't go into all that. I talked a little bit about it, but I don't have to go into that right now. But they got to identify that soil type because that's going to affect how you're going to protect that, that uh, excavation. The employer also has to call before digging to make sure all the utilities are marked. Anyone going into a trench, the employer's got to provide cave-in protection for trenches five feet or deeper. Now, some areas, some states in the country, it's four feet or deeper, unless it's solid rock. So anytime the trench is going to go five feet or deeper, you got to have some kind of protection. You can see in this picture, they have uh, a system of, uh, of shielding, shielding. They got whales and cheating, and so that's how that's working. A competent person's got to inspect the trench before each shift and okay workers to enter. You shouldn't get on a job site and just jump down in the hole yourself without the competent person checking it out first. Lots of things can change overnight or during the day or in between shifts. The competent person's got to inspect it. A way of escape has got to be provided. Um, they call it egress or a way out. So that has to be either a ramp at the end of the of the trench, or a ladder within twenty within twenty five feet of where the workers are working. So wherever the workers are, a ladder has to be or or a ramp within twenty five feet. You can see that this ladder in this picture is is um is is done done right you see it's tied off to uh this strut right here so it's not going to uh, slip over it's extending up above beyond the edge of the uh of the of the trench remember when we talked about ladders how how high above the upper level the ladder has to extend do you remember that we talked about it it's three feet right so this picture cuts it off, but my guess is that that's done properly, that these guys are doing this the way it should be done. Equipment like water pumps, ventilators must be in good condition. Obviously, anytime you're working in the trench, you wanna make sure stuff works. <laughs> you don't wanna jump down in there with something that looks like your great-great-grandfather used it in the First World War. You want to make sure the stuff's in good condition and it's going to do what you want it to do. So there are four methods to support a trench. Four, four methods, sloping, benching, shoring, and shielding. So I want to show you pictures of each of those four methods just so that you're you know, sort of familiar with what they actually look like. So for sloping, this is a good uh, Depending on the type of soil and its likelihood to, uh, to you know, collapse, you have, to, to, you have to set the angle of the slope. If you look at this angle right here, it looks like it's, what, maybe 33, 34 degrees, maybe, maybe 45 degrees, okay? But it's way out there. It's a good angled slope because this obviously is fairly loose soil. This is not a really hard clay-like soil. So sloping. Note also how much room it takes from here to here. That's quite a wide space. So you can't, you wouldn't be able to do sloping down a street in a city because they would take up the entire street. So you can't use that in that application. You gotta use something else. This is out in the country someplace. Benching is similar to uh, sloping. 
in that depending on the type of soil, you can bench the, the excavation. So you see there's a certain amount of elevation here and a certain amount of depth and a certain amount of elevation and a certain amount of depth and a certain amount of elevation and a certain amount of depth. So this is called benching it because it, it looks like a bench. Okay, it's very similar to sloping except you don't have to smooth it out. And you can see that these guys are doing it over here. You got it. You see this is the edge here and it comes up, comes up here and then goes over and in like that. So that's benching. Again, you see this is new construction. It's out maybe in the boonies. There's still plenty of space there. They're not tearing up somebody's sidewalk or doing this before that. Uh, you know, so it's, it's one option. Certainly, again, something you couldn't use in the city, on a street in the city where you don't have a lot of room. Shoring, okay. This is a support system made up of posts whales, struts, and sheeting. And hydraulic shoring here is very common. So basically what you have here is these red members here. These are struts. So they're hydraulically pushing out. These horizontal members right here, um, I, okay, it, let me get this arrow on it. So it's right here, this horizontal member, there's another one right here. Down here at the bottom, you can see these are called whales, W-A-L-E-S, okay? So we have struts and whales. And then this side paneling right here is what you call, those are, that's, that's the sheeting, okay? And this is a pretty good application. Um, you know, it's extended way above the edge of, uh, of the excavation, so well protected. It's continuous, so there's no breaks in it. They do have ladders in here. You know, I suppose you might complain about this ladder because it doesn't extend three feet above. A little bit of a challenge for somebody getting out this way. Why? What do you, why, why do you suppose it'd be a little bit of a challenge? Yeah, you're right. Because once they climb up here, they're going to stand on the edge of the sheeting, and then how are they going to get down here? They're going to have to jump down. So that's not not a great situation. Um, probably could be fixed if they had you know a, a ladder on the other side as well, so you could climb up one and climb down the other. But still, all in all, not a bad situation. Definitely good for uh, example to provide to protect from cave-in, which is what we're mostly concerned with. So in addition to um, sh uh, shoring, um, we have shielding. And these are, these are systems that come pre-assembled. You don't assemble this on the job site. They come, they come assembled already. And they sometimes call these trench boxes, okay? So you just carry these out just like this. They're all pre-assembled. They can be expanded, uh, you know, through these struts here, and and you just throw that in in the hole, and you can and you can slide it along, or you can pick it up and leapfrog them as you as you go. So different different methods. Okay. So what's wrong with this picture here? So what do you think about this guy? Yeah, this is not this is not good. This is not good. You have a very narrow trench. The guy's way down in there over his head. No protection whatsoever. He does have a ladder. You know, it looks like a little giant in, in the end. But the spoil pile, check out. I mean, the spoil pile is all along the edge here, right along the edge here. No protection in the hole. This is an accident waiting to happen. You know, as we said, soil is made up of a variety of things, such as sand, loam, and rock. Um, the amount of water in the soil can add to the weight. Now, just think about, just think about this. A cubic yard can weigh between 2,000 and 3,000 pounds. Okay, 2,000 pounds is actually a ton. <laughs> so this is a, 
a block of soil that's a yard wide, a yard high, and a yard deep. That's a cubic yard. So if that collapses on you, you're under 2,000 pounds of pressure. You're not going to breathe, just flat out. You're going to take your last breath, and as soon as you start to exhale, the, the crush of that soil is going to push down on you, and you're not going to be able to, to get air in, even if there was air. You wouldn't be able to do it. All sorts of other things happen, um, you know, that with the compression on your on your system, um, you know, people just when it collapses on their leg uh, and the pressure on their leg before they're able to dig them out, if they're maybe they're working by themselves, collapses on their leg and they can't get out, um, you know, they can lose their leg. So uh, you know that's. You know, that's not good. You definitely don't want to get in a situation where you're going to get, uh, you know, stuck in a trench collapse, you know, just flat out. You just don't want to happen. Okay. So I think we covered trench collapse is pretty good. There's a ton more to know about it. Believe me, there's a ton more. If you get into doing any work in excavation, it's a great, it's, you know, being a, the operating engineer is a great organization. Um, you know, you, you need to, there's a ton to know about operating the, the equipment, but, you know, it's a lot of fun and a, a great, a great job. Um, but you're going to have to have more training. And if you're, you know, you're in the pipe trades or electrical trades where you're putting stuff underground, definitely need to know how to work around trenches. So a lot more to know. You're going to want to get more training. This, this, this is just a little bit of awareness to keep you from jumping down in there. And, you know, like when I first started, I, there was a lot of questions I had. I remember asking journeyman, is this safe to do? And the answer was usually, ah, it hasn't hurt me. <laughs> oh, it's all right, kid. Uh, anytime they say that, you know, your eyebrows should go up and go like, hey, <laughs> I want to know a little bit more about this. Never be afraid to ask questions. And if something looks sketchy, always ask the journeyman to show you how to do it. Okay? Always ask the journeyman to show you how to do it. So, two more uh, things to cover. Uh, caught... Uh, caught between uh, hazards, caught in machinery or mechanical equipment and rollovers. So let's talk about machinery. Oh, wait a second. Yeah, okay. Talk about machinery. What types of machines can we get caught in? Okay, so saws, presses, conveyors, bending and rolling and shaping machines. There's lots of machines like this in the sheet metal industry. Hand-powered tools, uh, you know, a lot of, you know, the half-inch drills and grinders and uh, impact wrenches and things like that definitely can get uh, can get you caught up. Forklifts is a whole other thing all by itself, and personnel hoist. So I, I have uh, some pictures here. You know, here's a piece of equipment. You know, lots of moving parts, stuff that you can get caught in. This is actually a personnel hoist. You'll see these very common on construction sites. This is a this is a, a two, you know, two cabin one. You got you know a lift there and a lift there, and they uh, they go up and down on this uh, vertical structure that you see running down in between the two of them. Um, you know, the average guy. Um, you know, when you're when you're working on a project like this, um, you know you're going to be doing uh, what your you know what your trade is. You're going to get into that lift and go on up to the floor that you're working on and get off of it. Um, there usually is a, a guy inside there who will operate it, maybe a laborer or an operator, uh, and you know so you don't have to mess with any of the controls. Or, or anything like that, uh, but uh, you definitely don't want to um, 
you know, goof around on this area, on this uh, this thing, you know, the, the vertical uh, structure that that um, because there's because there's counterweights inside here, and as these um, calves go up, the counterweight comes down. Okay, and so you don't want to stick your arm in here. You don't want to um, you know stick your head in there uh, for anything to check out where that other calf is. You know, just stay away from that. There was a actually there was a an operating engineer in Las Vegas who had just retired and he thought he would oil something up and he didn't lock out this this other cab and he, he was working on this this cab and stuck his head and his body into this um, this climbing uh, superstructure here and the counterweight from the other one came by and and, uh, and killed him. So uh, you know, this is the type of things. There's moving equipment, moving stuff that you want to avoid. Okay. So as far as saws go, very common. Um, or chop saws, hand saws, uh, uh, table saws. They all have these guards. Okay. Now a lot of times people will, you know, they. They figure, oh, well, I'm tough or I'm smart and I, and I don't need those guards. So they'll wire them up and you don't want to do that because those things are there to protect you. And um, I've got a friend who only has his first finger and his pinky, his two middle fingers chopped off carpenter and uh, it happened with a saw. And it happens, it, it happens to apprentices and it happens to seasoned guys too. Uh, because they just get, you just get careless. You're just working and you're not paying attention. And these saws are extremely sharp and it just takes a split second and you can, you can really hurt yourself. So any type of equipment that has moving parts should be machine guarded. Another thing to, to be aware of is don't wear loose clothing or jewelry. A lot of guys these days they want to have these, uh, you know, these dangly ear ear things, uh, you know, ear ear jewelry and finger jewelry and and lip jewelry and you know all this kind of stuff. That that stuff can get tangled up and it'll rip your ear right off. You know, you're climbing around the scaffold. Uh, you know, some number ten wire or something's hanging out and gets tangled up in some jewelry, um, it, it can rip it off. I never wore my, my wedding ring when I was out on the job because as a painter, I get solvent underneath it and burn my finger. And when I was climbing around scaffold, you can go from one level to another and a little burr gets stuck underneath that, that ring and you can, uh, you know, if you don't rip your finger off, you can just rip all the skin off of both of your knuckle. So very important, uh, you know, don't wear loose clothing and jewelry out on a job site, leave it at home, uh, tell your wife you love her, and, uh, and that's why you wanna bring all your fingers home with you every day, and uh, she'll appreciate that. Number three, don't be embarrassed to ask your employer for training and safe use of equipment. Really, seriously, don't be embarrassed to ask for training. Uh, you know, you're an apprentice, you're just getting started. You shouldn't, everybody knows you don't know anything. So ask questions and, uh, you know, pay attention. And, and uh, that's a 90% of it, you're gonna, you're, gonna, you're gonna do just fine. As far as being in a piece of equipment like a, a backhoe, uh, or or a or any any type of equipment. Again, you need to get training on how to use these things. Don't work parallel to steep grades or embankments on unstable soil. You only only use equipment with ROPS ROPS. It's called it, down at the bottom here. You can see what it says: Rollover Protective Systems. And fasten your seatbelt. Number one thing: fasten your seatbelt anytime you're working in these pieces of equipment. If the equipment starts to roll over, 
don't try to jump out. This guy right here, Doyle Peaks, you see him right there? He's on a pillow. Why is he on a pillow? Because this, he tried to jump out when this thing tipped over and it crushed his leg and he's stuck under there. There's no way, nobody can pick this thing up. You gotta get a crane out there. So he, they brought him a pillow, maybe a my pillow, who knows? <laughs> so make him comfortable while they wait to get a crane out there. Terrible. If you start to tip over, always keep, grab onto the steering wheel, keep your elbows in and ride it out. The rollover protection should protect you. And uh, so that's the number one thing you want to do if you're starting to uh, tip over in a rollover uh, type accident. You don't want to stick your hand out to brace yourself. There's no way you're going to stop that thing. You're, all you're going to do is break your arm. So uh, just a thing to remember in terms of rollovers. All right. So our summary, what are the three main causes caught between you got uh, you know, your cave ends, you've got your equipment uh, and tools, and you got rollovers. Describe how to control hazards that cause cop betweens. You know, you, you have to understand how, uh, you know, how collapses take place, understand about, uh, you know, soil composition, make sure that a competent person is checking it out, make sure that you're, you're uh, your excavation is protected before you get down in there. You don't want to wear jewelry and loose clothing. You always want to know how to use equipment. Uh, the first job I went out on, guy, the foreman said, have you ever driven this? It was, a, it was a, an all-wheel terrain forklift. I said, yeah, I didn't have a clue how to do it. He tossed me the keys and tossed another guy keys to the other one. He said the same thing. We were both young kids, just got out of the army, 19 years old, 20 years old. And uh, the other kid drove his into the river. <laughs> I don't know. I was just lucky. But get training on equipment. And then describe safe operation when, uh, when there's a rollover hazard, which is keep your hands on the steering wheel. Make sure your seatbelts uh, fastened at all times. All right, guys. Hey, that's the focus for. Really glad you spent some time. Um, uh, spent some time with me. It's been great. Um, and uh, don't forget to take the little quiz that's coming up. And uh, be good and have a safe, uh, safe career. Take care. Bye.